you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And today we are in a new chapter, Luke chapter 6. So please take your Bibles and let's turn together. And we're going to look at the first five verses of Luke chapter 6. Here's what the scriptures tell us. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Certain of the Pharisees said unto him, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? Jesus answering said, Have ye not read so much as when David did, when he himself was hungered, and they that which were, which were with him? He went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. He said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, if we look at this passage, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, you're going to see that Jesus is going to have a confrontation with the Pharisees. And in this confrontation, he's going to make a bold statement. He's going to say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And the question is, what does he mean by that? Well, the question is, who actually created the Sabbath? And it's God. So Jesus is claiming in these verses to actually be God. Sometimes people say, well, there's nowhere in the Bible that Jesus ever says, I'm God. Well, this is a clear example of it. He didn't use the words, I am God. Instead, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, who, which was created by God on that first week that uh, he creates the world and everything in it. And so it's a very clear, direct statement that Jesus is claiming to be the creator, the Lord, who is the one who instituted the Sabbath. But what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to actually get into some of the content here, because what you're going to see is in these verses, he's going to talk about the fact that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And the next section that Lord willing, we'll look at tomorrow, he's going to demonstrate by performing a miracle that's supposed to authenticate that statement that he makes. So with that in mind, let me give you a summary statement and then kind of talk through the storyline of a very intriguing passage of scripture. Jesus used a simple controversy between himself and the religious elites to directly claim to be the creator, God in flesh. That is the whole point of this section that we're looking at. So let me kind of give you the storyline of this controversy. Jesus' and disciples were walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath day. And as they were doing that, they were hungry. And so he and the disciples began to pick ears of corn and they broke off the kernels and they began to eat them. Now, we need to recognize that when we're reading this passage of scripture, the way that someone living in Israel during the first century would look at this action would be very different than the way that you and I would look at that as Westerners. As Westerners, when we hear of people walking through a field and eating corn, we say they're stealing corn from somebody else's field. But we have to recognize that in those days, People that were farmers in Israel were responsible to not even take in all the produce in their, all the crops that they grew. They were responsible to leave some for people who were walking by, people who were poor, so that they could go out and they could actually glean. In some sense, it was a little bit like the welfare system that we have in our country, except it wasn't a free handout. People had to go and work to get the food. Well, these people are not working on the Sabbath day to bring in produce to their homes. They're simply eating in the moment. It would be sort of like going into your, your fridge and pulling out uh, milk and pouring a glass of milk or going into your cupboard and pulling out a bag of potato chips. They're essentially doing that kind of a thing. They're picking food out of the field. So when, when they do this, the Pharisees are observing what Jesus is doing. And it's kind of interesting. Why would somebody be sitting there watching Jesus? Well, the truth is that the Pharisees hated Christ. They were looking for every possible opportunity that they could have to bring an accusation against him. And as soon as they see that he is eating this food and that his disciples are eating this food, they immediately say, look, you are violating the law. Now, it's very important for us to understand that the Bible clearly states that the Sabbath day is a day of rest. It's set aside so that we can rest our bodies and cease from our labors and so that we can spend time focusing on God. But what is very interesting about the way that the Sabbath day is presented in the Old Testament is that there's really not a lot of information given about what is allowed and what is not allowed. For instance, if an animal fell into the ditch and the animal stuck in the ditch, 
you, you were not required to just let the animal die in the ditch. You were supposed to go and pull the animal out of the ditch because the animal's life is in danger. And so that wasn't viewed as work in the sense of going into your fields and harvesting. That was simply looked at as going to preserve life. On the other side, a person would eat meals on the Sabbath day. And so in the eyes of Christ and the disciples, that's what they're doing. They're simply eating a meal on the Sabbath day. But the Pharisees didn't like this ambiguity. And so rather than recognizing that God allowed people to think through situations where they could actually go and bring their animal in on a day that the animal had fallen and gotten hurt, making sure that their animals actually can eat on the Sabbath day, that their families could eat on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees established this system of rules to dictate what was and wasn't allowed on the Sabbath day. Now, the rules that the Pharisees were dictating were not biblical rules. They were simply arbitrary rules that they had established. And not all of those rules would have been bad, per se. It wasn't like God told them not to do that. But their rules did not carry the same authority as what the Bible was teaching. Well, this controversy that comes up to Christ, where the Pharisees are coming after Christ, is something that Jesus is going to, he's going to deal with straightforward. And he's not just going to deal with it straightforward, but he's going to use this as an example to demonstrate that he, in fact, has the right to determine what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable on the Sabbath day. So verses 2 to 4 says this, The certain Pharisee said unto him, Why do ye that which is not lawful on the Sabbath day? Jesus answering said, Have ye not read so much as this, that what David did when himself was in hunger, that they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. Now, this is a really interesting illustration. And when I read through this illustration, I think about the illustration. I have to admit that I'm not 100% confident about what I'm going to say. But what I am going to tell you is what I think Jesus is trying to communicate here. First of all, Jesus is confronting what we could say is the arbitrary judgment of the religious leaders. They are establishing rules God did not establish, and they're giving those rules the authority of God. Now, when we read through the Old Testament, we clearly see that there was bread that was, that was made and was to be kept in the tabernacle and then in the temple that was sacred. It was set apart to God. But there's a lot of information that was not given about the nature of that bread. For instance, I know of no law in the Old Testament that says when the bread has been used, it has to be thrown away in a certain way, or it's not possible for somebody to eat this bread who is not a part of that. The, the fact is that there's, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's not much given. We know that this was set apart bread and that the priests would eat it in the worship of God, but we don't know all these rules that were associated with it. So it is very likely that people would have established rules about how to deal with the showbread that did not bear God's authority. These were rules that they established. They recognized that there was a sacredness about this bread, but some of these rules would not have necessarily borne God's authority. And so in the situation where David is running for his life with his men, they come to a priest and they say, we are hungry. Can you give us food? We're going to die. We're famished. Well, the man says, the only bread that I have available is bread that is showbread. It's being used in the tabernacle. And then he basically says this. If your men have not done certain things, and if they are sanctified, then they can eat this bread to preserve their life. Now, the question is, where was the law given for him to make such a judgment? The answer is, there wasn't one. The fact is that the man made a judgment call, and he made a judgment call basically violating the rules that the religious leaders of the day probably established where God did not give direct command related to this issue of the showbread. And so Jesus was basically saying there was nothing wrong with Abiathar the priest making this judgment call because God never directly contradicted that kind of an action. He recognized that there was food available and that this food could be given to them under these circumstances. And so he made a judgment call about that. Basically, what Jesus is saying is this. 
just like Abiathar made such a judgment call, I am making such a judgment call as well. But I want you to realize something, Pharisees. I have the right to make this judgment call. You don't have the right to make this judgment call. You've established your rules and regulations, and they don't bear God's authority. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I created the Sabbath. I had a reason for the Sabbath. And so I know what is right and what is wrong on the Sabbath day. And these people eating corn on the Sabbath day does not violate the Sabbath day. And I have the right to say that because I'm the one who made the Sabbath day. That is really the sense of what Jesus is communicating to these men. So he uses an illustration of someone who made a judgment call to preserve life where God had not given direct command about some of the things that they could and couldn't do with the showbread. And Jesus is basically saying, I'm making a judgment call too, but my judgment call bears the authority of God. The one who said, this is right, this is wrong, I established this day, I have the right to make that kind of a judgment. You say, well, well, how does Jesus have the right to make such a judgment? Who made him the authority on such a matter? That would be the thinking of the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. Well, the fact is nobody made him the authority. He is the authority. In other words, the authority wasn't delegated to Jesus. He bears that authority by virtue of his position and his nature. He's God. He's the creator. He's the one who ordered the universe. He's the one who established that first seven-day week. He's the one that said the seventh day is a day of rest, Shabbat. And so he has the right, by virtue of his position and by virtue of his nature, to dictate what is acceptable and what is not acceptable on the Sabbath day. That means that the main point of the passage in front of us was that Jesus was qualified to make this judgment call because unlike the Pharisees, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he says that in verse 5. He said unto them, the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. And you say, who's the Son of Man? It's Jesus. Jesus has the right to say this is acceptable and this is not acceptable because he's the one who set aside the day. This is a direct, clear command, uh, uh, claim on, on the per, part of Christ that he is God in flesh. This controversy was meant to bring to a head an opportunity for Jesus to demonstrate, I have the right to make such a judgment call because I am God in flesh. I'm qualified. I can make that call. And you know what's interesting? the religious leaders understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus was understood, and they were furious. And what we're going to see in the next section that we'll look at the next time we come together is that Jesus is going to further, <laughs> further get them stirred up because he's going to make a point to heal a man on the Sabbath day. And when he does that, he's basically going to say, by whose power and authority has this man been healed? by God's authority. Does God permit people to be healed on the Sabbath? The answer is, of course he does. And so what's he going to do? He's going to demonstrate that he's the Lord of the Sabbath again. And he's going to do it in a visible way. It's one thing to say, hey, I have the right to tell these men they can eat corn. It's another thing for him to do something that is undeniably miraculous. And as he does what's undeniably miraculous, these men have no choice but to say, either we accept him as the Lord of the Sabbath or we ignore this miracle and we reject him as the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is going to bring this issue to a head. And that's the point of the passage in front of us. So you might ask, well, pastor, how do you practically apply what's here? The practical implication of this text is this. Jesus is God in flesh. That's how we need to view him. That's how we need to speak about him. That's how we need to relate to him. And I want to add this. Because Jesus is God in flesh... We need to worship him as God in flesh. And I also want you to realize that this is a, is a very, very important doctrinal matter. The fact is there's no gospel without God coming and dwelling amongst his people, Emmanuel, and going to the cross. There is no forgiveness. There is no cleansing. There is no justification apart from God in flesh taking our place on the cross. 
And so it's very important that we marvel at the importance of this precious doctrine. And it's very important that we worship the Lord Jesus Christ as exactly who he is, God in flesh. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you this morning. If it has, please share that and consider sharing this with someone who can be blessed by it. Let's bow together for prayer, and then I hope you have a great rest of your day. Father, thank you for the opportunity to reflect on a very important text of Scripture. Uh, help us to understand the implications and help us to be thoroughly convinced that Jesus of Nazareth is God in the flesh and that this doctrine of the dual nature of Christ being God and man at the same time, fully God, fully man, this doctrine of the incarnation would be something that we marvel in and we glory in your wonderful plan of redemption and we rest securely in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hope you have a great rest of your morning, and Lord willing, we will continue our study next time. Bye now.